I'm impressed to be here in New Mexico. I've talked to so many people who don't know that this is the only state in the country that is officially, I believe in its constitution, bilingual. Spanish and English are the official languages. And so I can say, buenas tardes a todos, y que tal, y como esta, um, and, uh, and hope that I know what I'm saying. Because my mom did not teach us Spanish. Pero ahora yo puedo hablar bastante bien para engañar a los que no lo hablan. Which means I now speak well enough to fool people if you don't actually speak Spanish, which I think can be so helpful. And I am so excited to be here in the presence of so many people who are not normal. Um, educators are not normal. School board members are not normal. Uh, somewhere down the line, someone asked you, if you wanted to uh, spend your precious lives, your personal time, making the world a better place for someone else's child. And you raised your hand and you said, I'll do it. And you are here because you love someone else's child. We have made someone else's child our life's work, and we are proudly, passionately, and profoundly not normal that we decided to do that. I think it's important um, that we talk to each other in places like this, that we listen to each other. There are a lot of things you can do on a webcast now. There are a lot of things you can phone in, you can do electronically. But there's something very special that happens when people are physically together in a space like this. Um, I get to be with a lot of people. I'm the president uh, of the National Education Association, three million men and women who work in America's public schools, colleges, and universities. And we want very much to use the power that we have so that our students can be successful. But even as big as we are, I know that we cannot be successful unless we're successful first in building bridges into the community until we understand the families that we serve. And I am so excited about this movement. This is the Golden Gate Bridge of Opportunity of all time. I, I believe we are seeing a true movement. And just looking at how large this audience is, tells me that we're on a roll here. I believe this is the movement that the world has been waiting for. The world has been so focused for so long on this factory model built around corporate competition, built around privatization and standardization, and hit your number for prizes or punishments. Every parent, every educator, every advocate for the whole child could see that that corporate model of so-called school reform was going to fail. We knew that some kind of, yes, please clap, yes. We knew that some de zero defects factory model um, of 100% uh, um, percent of human type children uh, hitting some kind of cut score on a standardized test would eventually collapse from the weight of its own absurdity, we now have a chance, a fighting chance, to build something that does work. And I want to take a little of my time this morning to talk to you about what I believe scares so many people. It makes them so nervous. But I believe it is the foundation that will take us to another level. And that is a belief in the wisdom of the community. We talk about the whole child so easily, but we rarely talk about the magic 
of the whole community. I want to talk about a, a field trip I went on. Um, I went to Honduras. The NEA has a foundation. And we were trying to learn from other organizations about um, how they serve disadvantaged communities. And the Heifer Foundation asked us if we wanted to go on a trip. And I remember thinking, Heifer, it sounds like a cow. It is a cow. It is absolutely a cow. After World War uh, II, a minister, uh, the guy that founded Heifer, went on a mission to feed starving people in Europe. And after a year, he had organized food drives and he had organized uh, places for people to come and feeding centers. And after a year, people were no longer starving. It was time for him to leave. And he realized that he was leaving behind nothing. He said, they didn't need a cup of milk. They needed a cow. And Heifer was born. He went back home and he convinced uh, his farmer friends in Indiana to give him donations, not of money, but of pigs and cows and chickens and goats and seed corn. And the heifer folks told me um, how they had developed over 60 years. They said, in the beginning, we made a lot of mistakes, but our plan was we would learn from our mistakes and we would constantly get better. As we did mistakes, we would stop doing them. So you can see they have no uh, future in political office. Um, after 60 years, Heifer is an amazing, successful process. It looks very different community to community. But whether they're in South Africa or South America, they have certain principles that lead the communities. Um, we need to know more about the mistakes that they stopped doing. The nice lady at Heifer said, you know, our first mistake was we focused on what communities didn't have. They didn't have money, they didn't have health care, they didn't have education, we totally depressed them. Second mistake, uh, we would always come in, we wanted to introduce ourselves to the villagers and we would introduce and we would call in everybody. We said we want the whole village to come and only the men would show up and the men would sit in the seats and the women would stand at the back of the room and we thought, oh well, this must be the culture so uh, we will respect that. And we only worked with the men. And it always fell flat on its face. We ignored half the heart, soul, and brain power of that community. Mistake number three, they said all the families were poor, but some families were poorer than others. So it was um, those families that were not as poor we decided we should give the first gifts of animals to those that were a little bit better off because they'd be more successful. They'd serve as an example for the rest of the community. It never worked. It never trickled down to the poorest of the poor. Fourth mistake, we called in an expert. Thank you for laughing. Uh, we called in some really, really, really smart researchers who would tell the villagers exactly what they were doing wrong, which I'm sure was really appreciated. And we showed no respect for them. Uh, we never asked them what they thought. We said, here's what the research says, and here's what you need to do. And it never occurred to us that they might know something we didn't know. And when we left, they were glad we left, and they went right back to doing things, even though what they were doing wasn't working. She said, we do very different things now. When we come in, we don't look at what they don't have. We look at what they do have. They're hardworking. They love their kids. They're generous. They're kind. We can build on that. Now, when we ask the villagers to come and just the men sit in the seats, we go, oh, excuse us, but make some room here so that the ladies can sit down. And the poorest of the poor would never even come in the room. 
we'd go out and we would bring them in. They said, we are finding strong, creative leaders where no one was looking for them. The most outcast amongst them would have some piece of wisdom to add to what we were trying to build. When Heifer asked the community, who do you think should get the first gifts? They said, the poorest of the poor. Of course, the rest of us are in a little bit better position. We can, we can help them when they need help. But most important, she said, we had experts who had good information, but they were the wrong people to make the plan. The experts gave some good information to the villagers. The villagers had to create the plan. They had to take a look at whether or not the plan was working. They had to talk amongst themselves. When they owned it, then it became theirs. And we started the plan by always asking them the same question. We said, imagine what your village would be if you were proud to have your children raised here and live here, what would it look like? And then they would start to dream. And they'd dream about owning, owning a little piece of, of property. They'd dream about building a schoolhouse. They'd dream about starting their own little business. She said, once you got them to dream, then nothing could stop them. You see, the way that heifer works is they give you a pregnant cow, but you don't own the cow until the calf is born and you raise the calf and you give the calf to the next family. Then the cow is yours and the next family raises the calf. You own the chicken when you pass the chicks on to the next family. Heifer is based on a structure of pregnant animals. I'm not sure how we fit that into school accountability, but we're working on that. And they said, here's what we found year after year after year. As the families would help each other, at the beginning it was because they knew who was next in line for the cow and the chicken and the goats. And so they would come over and say, how are things going? Can we help you? After a few years, people would do that just because it was what good neighbors did. They had started to build a caring culture where they all looked after each other and they were all good neighbors. Heifer is our good neighbor and I think we should know more about what their work means to community schools. How many of our most struggling schools hire some expert to come in and tell us what we're doing wrong? And then they wonder why we don't appreciate it. And when they leave, we're glad. And we go back to doing things the way we'd always done them, even though what we were doing wasn't working. How many of those experts ignore the voices of the principal and the teachers and the support staff, uh, the people who teach them and feed them? How many of them would never think to ask a single mom who's just struggling with two jobs to put food on the table? What would help her? with her children back at home. How many experts see the families and the educators in a struggling school as the problem to be fixed instead of the solution? How many improvement plans are designed around some quick success on paper? Uh, so you focus on uh, getting rid of the arts and music and sports and recess so that you can focus on drilling and drilling and drilling to get that standardized test score up three points. You focus on the cusp kids, on the bubble kids, so that you can make your number. Heifer has no bubble families. They do what's right for the whole community and everyone helps everyone. And Heifer starts with those that are most in need. It's structured to raise the entire community up 
together, not in cutthroat competition, but in a culture of kindness and cooperation and mutual support. Um, I was working on this little thing before I saw this rising together. That is the only way that it works. And Heifer's system works because it is based and structured and built on deep respect. It gathers a lot of data. They're not afraid of data, but they gather meaningful data and they put it in the hands of the caring people who are in that community and they say, what does this mean to you? What would you like to work on? What should we improve? What's going great that we should do more of? If it's not working, it's the community that decides to stop doing it. It's the community decides to decide what they should be doing. And a true community school is built after that heifer community model. Trust in the people who have to make it work. NEA has been more and more involved in community schools. More of our members are the teachers and the support staff that work in those schools, Colorado, Arizona, Arkansas. We're seeing some amazing research in Maryland and Boston and Washington State. Um, community schools have been improving the work habits, the positive attitudes of students. They feel safe. They feel someone cares about them in that school. They go to school ready to learn. That's not warm, fuzzy stuff. That's essential to building a school climate where kids take off. The best community schools aren't simply focused around a healthcare center or a dental uh, clinic in the school. They're not just wraparound services. They're schools that deal with the deep academic needs of those students. More and more of these community schools are um, connected to community colleges. They're bringing in international baccalaureate programs. They're early college high schools. They truly support what we know is the whole child. That's not poetry for us. That is essential. The whole child, the critical, creative, thinking mind, the healthy body, the compassionate, ethical character of those students. For a community school, success is about so much more than you could ever fit on a standardized test score. And we have to be the ones that clearly define that success. Once I accepted an invitation from um, a corporate think tank, very um, anti-union, very pro-privatization, we got along really well, um, and they invited me to be the main entree on a panel discussion, um, and the title was, How Schools Can Do More With Less. How creative was that? Um, so I'm supposed to get up there, I suppose, and say, well, I guess if we don't have any more money, here are the things that NEA doesn't mind uh, cutting. Um, I'm not going to do that. So I got up and I said, do more with less. I get the less part. You want me to accept the premise that public schools are going to get less. Less funding, less resources, less staff, less services, less programs. I get that part. And no, I don't accept it. But do more what exactly? What is it you think I do as an elementary teacher that you want me to do more of? when you're going to give me less. Now, if you tell me you want me to do more of hitting a cut score on a standardized test, we can all go home early. Yeah, we can do that easy, because kids won't need to analyze, construct, organize, synthesize, entertain, create, lead, communicate, provoke a controversial thought, ask an incredible question. It's really easy when all you ask me to do is to have my kids memorize someone else's answer. But do more. What? 
begs the question, what is the purpose of public education? What am I here to do more of? I never walked into my classroom at Orchard Elementary one day of my life that I didn't know my purpose down to my bones. I was supposed to open a child's mind to its infinite possibilities. Now, you want me to do more of that, I need more stuff. I need, I need everything. I need you to align your resources with that. I need the support staff. I need the professionals. I need the home organizers, the people who will connect with the community. I need technology. I need training. I need time. I need to be able to build a relationship with my students and with the families that I serve. I need everything you've got if you want me to build the whole and happy child. Because to serve that whole and happy child, I need to put everything in front of them. In my class, you got a jelly bean if you had a good answer. You got two jelly beans if you had a good question. And all my kids had cavities. I want that on my evaluation. <laughs> There is hope for the whole child today, hope I didn't have a year ago. I got to stand over President Obama's shoulder and watch him sign away, no child left untested. Gone. Gone is AYP, adequate yuppie parents. Um, gone is federal Test and punish. It's gone. But what will replace it is the work left to do. Every student succeeds is our greatest opportunity to rewrite what it means to teach and what it means to learn. It is not done yet because it is the state's and the local school districts that will fill in those blanks. And it means that they need us. They need the advocates. They need the educators. They need the parents. And they need people who care about that community. They need that concept of what a neighborhood public school is supposed to do for that whole child. The new law calls for a dashboard of better indicators. So we need to go there with our ideas. What is worth measuring? A standardized test can actually give you a little bit of information about general trends. They were never designed to say this third grader shouldn't go to fourth, grader, fourth grade, or this student shouldn't graduate, or this teacher should lose her job. So what kind of indicators will tell us I made out a lot of report cards. I'm a teacher. We invented tests. But we use them in the appropriate way to guide instruction. I want to know about uh, student absenteeism and tardies. I want to know how many students are graduating. But couldn't we even say, how many students are graduating having already earned college credit? If a school was being held, um, accountable for that, you would have to be putting some incredibly strong student programs and supports in there. And on this dashboard of better indicators, for the first time since 1965, since President Johnson signed this law into our vocabulary, we also have to measure student services and supports. Who has a school librarian? Who has a school nurse? What kind of advanced placement programs do they have and where do they have them? Which kids get everything, the theater programs and sports, and which kids don't even get recess? Those are the kinds of things we can advocate should be on that uh, report card. What do we want to do more of? The NEA can think of no better model than the community schools model to talk about what 
should be delivered to that whole and happy child. While other folks are out there, we love you. This is, you are us. This, this is, you are gonna remember where you were when the revolution began. I was talking to some of our panelists. This is the revolution. When someone asks a rhetorical question, yeah, well, if it's not test and punish, if it's not uh, vouchers, if it's not for-profit charter school chains, then what is it? It's not a rhetorical question. Stand up straight and say, you've got to come and see the community schools models. You've got to see what's transforming What's humanizing public education? This is more than some silver bullet. This is a thousand piece puzzle that we have a chance to put together. I heard a story once of a dad who was babysitting his preschool son and the kid was driving him crazy, just pestering him, and he was trying to read the paper. And finally, he looked down at the coffee table, and it was open to a magazine. It was open to the National Geographic, and it had this map of the world. And the dad gets this great idea. And he rips out a page, and he tears it into little pieces, and he hands it to his little boy. And he says, this is a puzzle. We're going to play a game. Take it in the kitchen and get the tape and tape it together. And the rules are, you're not allowed to talk until it's all done. And he thinks he's probably got a couple of hours of peace and quiet. And the little boy comes back in a couple of minutes, and it's all put together. And the dad's amazed. And he says, how did you do that? And the little boy said, well, it's kind of a trick. He turns it over, he said, See, there's a picture of the kid on, a, on the back. If you put the kid together first, the world comes together all by itself. <laughs> Keep raising your hand when someone says, who wants to change the world? Keep your purpose in front of you, put the picture of a child you love in front of you when someone says, well, what's the answer? What's the answer for that child that you love? The answer is everything. I want to give this child everything. And put that child together first so that the world will come together all by itself. This is not a game. This is real life. These are real human beings, and the world is counting on us. We will not let them down. Go, fight, win. Mil gracias, mis hermanos y hermanas.